Just picture, just picture tonight with author and historian Mike Klinger, who's just finished another book. We're about to wrap it up. Um, touch on that in just a minute and talk on his other ones. Tell us the name of it, where y'all can find it. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, I guess, well, basically uh, the Atlanta through uh, Franklin campaign. Hey, Mike, how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing pretty good. Yourself? I'm pretty good, buddy. Uh, you're, do you live in Georgia? You still live up in Ohio? I live in Indiana. Indiana. Okay. How cold is it up there? We had snow all day yesterday. I think it dropped down to 24 last night. It's supposed to drop there again today. Okay, so it was 37 down here in Birmingham, Alabama. So you can tell it's freezing for us. So, uh, but um, so tell me again, how many books have you written now? I got the second one going to the printer now. The well, first one, uh, I wrote a regimental history. Uh, it's on the 118th Ohio, and uh, I. Uh, I tracked down 500 letters, six diaries, and the Regimental Surgeon's Daybook. So it talks a great deal about the day-to-day -day conditions of the average soldier. They fought in East Tennessee, uh, starved in East Tennessee. They were on quarter to half rations for six months. Then they started in the Atlanta campaign in the Army of the Ohio, uh, or at Spring Hill, Franklin, Nashville. And finally, they were shipped east, and they landed on the Cape Fear River and move up, moved up and took Fort Anderson and eventually Wilmington and hooked back up with Sherman coming up from Savannah. Wow. Now, why this particular regiment? Uh, it was my hometown regiment for one thing, uh, company F, uh, enlisted in my hometown. And when I started the book, I thought I had three ancestors in the 118th, but I later found out I had five, two of the guys came home and married, uh, the Klinger boys sisters. Okay. We're, now, so they were, they always kind of interested me. Yeah, I could say where that would be. Very and I think that they were. That's a lot I think of that research. they were a good, solid. I started collecting that regiment when I was twenty years old. And I, I didn't get to write the book until I retired. So, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of research, man, to to, to come down with that kind of letters and um, uh, and diaries. Um, is this used? Do you know if this is used like in any colleges or anything? I mean, because that's 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 some good stuff there. You know, we all hear about the major things. You know, like uh, Jackson's flank attack. Just for example, we never hear about the individual soldiers' lives like that. Well, I uh, I went to the historical societies of every county that they were raised in, and I found a lot there. I found uh, uh, I found a great set of letters at uh, the Carlisle Military History Institute, the U.S. Army. And uh, my wife and I went out to D.C. and we spent a week going through the National Archives. And uh, uh, historical societies would uh, hook me up with people that they thought that might be interested or have something and uh, then once uh, the internet started 
Uh, you could just Google the name of whatever regiment you were looking for, and I found some more stuff. So well, tell me I think eventually, eventually I found about 80 photos of the men in the regiment. And since it's been published, I found another 11. Well, uh, tell me what it, what was it like? Um, you know, when obviously when they weren't fighting or getting ready to go, what was the average day like? I mean, was it just marching and sitting around and uh, just mundane stuff? I mean, what what did they do? How did they keep busy? I mean, in East Tennessee, most of it was uh, they were looking for food. Why were and, the uh, so so scary? I found. Well, when they, the Army of the Ohio marched over the mountains uh, to Knoxville, and they expected that they would be uh, supplied from the railroad line that ran from Chattanooga to Knoxville. After they got into Knoxville, uh, Chickamauga happened. And the Union lost Chattanooga, so they lost their supply uh, depot. And okay. for the Confederates, they were actually a little bit better off because the railroad that runs by Knoxville runs to Virginia. And so Longstreet was able to get some supplies from Virginia. Bragg was horrible, promised him that he would send uh, supplies, but never did. Yeah, Lincoln made some kind he of didn't statement even about send a death nail. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, now, this book right here, what was, what was, what was the name of it? 118th Ohio Regiment of so, Volunteers. From, so they went it's to the on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Yeah. So from, from, from there, they got shipped from Atlanta. They got shipped to take Wilmington? No. Uh, uh, from after Atlanta, Sherman left the 4th and the 23rd Corps to deal with Hood, mm -hmm. and he literally told them that if there's any fighting to be done, you'll have to do it. And uh, a lot of the guys in the 4th and the 23rd Corps kind of thought that they were being uh, abandoned. And... Uh, as it turned out, Sherman was pretty accurate. They did have to do the fighting. But they were pretty good units, both the 4th and the 23rd Corps. Uh, by that time, were veteran combat infantrymen, and uh, they knew their business well. Okay, so um, interesting. So how long did – so you did – yeah, you said you retired. Once you retired and you started writing, how long did it take you to write the book? Uh, about two years. So now, tell me about your latest book. Now, what's what's the name of this one? Well, this one's actually on uh, the Second Army of the Ohio, and okay. Now, is this then in the this Atlanta, right? for example, in the Atlanta camp. Please. I said, was, I was didn't that hear you. I said, was that the regiment that you just told me about the book? Was it part of the Second Ohio Army? Yes, it was. Okay. But oddly enough, anybody that's researching the uh, Atlanta campaign, the Confederate Army of Tennessee has had a history written about it. The Army of the Cumberlands had a history written about it. And the Union Army of 
the Tennessee has had a history written about it. So the only army that had not had a history written about it was the Army of the Ohio. So you are now, the only person who ever write a history on I think that on this. Yeah, so far. Well, congratulations, man. That so is far. something to be uh that is something to really be proud of right there to uh um be the first person to write because to be honest with you, I've heard of all those, you know, heard of but I don't think I've ever heard of the Army of the Ohio. Um so tell, I mean, is was that the is this, that gonna be the name of it? Well, the problem was that it was the smallest army in Sherman's forces. Okay. When it was in East Tennessee, it was the 23rd Corps and two divisions of the 9th Corps. They came west with Burnside. And then Burnside commanded in East Tennessee until he got sick. And then uh, he was replaced by another general who had an old war wound that got worse when a horse fell on him. And finally, Schofield took over. Now, Schofield is a very di difficult field. man to like. Schofield was head of this army? Yes, he was. Now, he was the one that was killed outside Atlanta, correct? And uh, no, that's McPherson. That okay. was the Army of Tennessee. Okay, all right. I don't. Well, I it was good. And sorry. the Army of Tennessee was almost twice as big as the Army of the Ohio. So, how many was in the Army of the Ohio? And the Army of the Cumberland was four times as big. Please so say how it many again. Was in the Army of the Ohio. No, he wasn't. Well, well, how, how many? many? Yeah. Uh, they started the Atlanta campaign with about 14,000 men. The two divisions of the Ninth Corps were shipped back east. And from that point on, they were just uh, the 23rd Corps. They got about 5,000 replacements during the campaign, during the Atlanta campaign in all three uh, artillery, cavalry, and infantry. But um, by the time of Franklin, they were down to about 10,000 men total in so the they had 23rd had of, Corps. They had had some heavy, heavy engagements then. Probably the worst engagement for the 23rd Corps was Rasaka. Well, is, well can, you, um, can, you, the guys can, you us, can you take us through it? Where, where did they start in the Atlanta campaign? Was that their first engagement, or um, can you take us through the engagements they were in? No. Yep. Okay. They were stretched across Crow Valley with their right up against uh, – Tunnel Hill and Rocky Face Ridge. Okay. And the Fourth Corps west? went from there up to the ridge. Is that like east to west or that's the same and, way? Uh, uh, mostly east to west. Okay. And then they did some skirmishing there. And uh, then when McPherson went on his flanking move to go through Snake Creek Gap, was supposed to cut the railroad at, uh, at, uh, at Rasaka. He got cold feet, and he did not. And Sherman sent the 23rd Corps in behind him, and... Uh, The problem with the 23rd Corps was they had a really, really bad general. His name was uh, Judah. And uh, as they were 
they were supposed to attack the Confederates at Resaca, but Judah did not reconnoiter his front. He did not line himself up with uh, McPherson's units to his right. He did not get his artillery into support position for the attack. And he just kept urging them to attack, attack, attack. Well, they came charging over this ridge and immediately they were under fire from the entire Confederate line. And at the bottom of the ridge, there was a creek that they had to wade. They got out of that creek, and then there was a bog with another creek running through it. They made it to that creek and a little bit beyond, but by that time, they'd been butchered. Uh, the 118th that I wrote, wrote the book on lost 116 men out of 270 in 10 minutes. The 80th Indiana that was immediately immediately on their left. Please. How many, how many minutes? You, you, they lost how many men in how many minutes? 116 out of 270 in 10 minutes. Wow. And the, uh, which is, by the way, more men than uh, uh, the famous Light Brigade lost in their charge. We all know the poem, but uh, uh, they lost more men. Actually, I think it, I, I'm not sure on this, Chris, but it's like 55, 55 Civil War regiments lost more men than the Light Brigade did in their charge. Uh, at Balakalava. I mean, that's a lot of people. The uh, 80th Indiana. That, yeah, it is. And uh, the 80th Indiana immediately on their left lost 126. Now, now were they just um, and uh, were the concentrated so much in their attack that they just overwhelmed them? I think that there were several things. Uh, uh, number one, uh, they ran through and over uh, some regiments of McPherson's, and that broke up their formation. And then they got to the bog and the swamp, so they're wading through knee-deep mud. And they finally uh, crossed the creek, but I doubt that very many men in the second division got further than 30 or 40 foot across the creek. Then they fell back to the creek and they sheltered under the banks and tried to keep up a fight, but the fight was over. Interestingly enough, if Judah would have brought his artillery up to the hill behind them that they just came over, he would have had a plunging fire on the Confederate batteries. As it was, they had no artillery support, and the Confederate line at Risaka is shaped like a upside down capital L and oh, wow. so they're the 23rd core they're being fired on in a um, triangulated 20, I mean, a, a triangulated fire they were the uh the 23rd core hit right at the angle cox's oh, division the went in against uh against the left and uh, Judas went in against the uh, the right, but I mean that's a military uh, style ambush. Judas division, 
for I mean you probably know this, but a lot of people, but that is a that is a yeah. military ambush right there when you're in a, a, a L shape or in uh, inverted L shape. That is a military style ambush for people who don't know. Yeah. Wow. And uh so all of the artillery fire from the conf the rest of the Confederate line enfiladed the uh, 118th Ohio's line and the second division of the 23rd Corps line. I uh, actually got a found an account of one soldier who was saying that uh, a cannonball from his right uh, carried away his backpack and left him unharmed. So I they're bet just he was bruised where the straps were, though. I mean, they're getting it from both sides. I mean, they're going right into the to the jaws. Yeah, it was like I say, he was an incompetent, and his men paid for it. Okay. Um. After, after. After Resaca, uh, they moved up to Cassville, where uh, Johnson planned to uh, to launch an attack against uh, the Twenty Third Corps. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, we, yeah. We never get told this stuff in and, the uh, campaigns. I don't know. Well, Johnson gets blamed a lot for not attacking, but at Resaca, he counterattacked and sent Hood in. They counterattacked and took heavy casualties and fell back. Then the Union forces on the south end of the line uh, captured a small hill and from that hill, they could start to shell uh, Johnson's trains. So Johnson had to evacuate Resaca. They fell back to Cassville, and Johnson planned on Bishop Polk and John Bell Hood's corps to strike the Army of the Ohio and uh, overwhelm them. The problem was that, and I, I talk about this a lot in the, uh, in the book on the Second Army of the Ohio, the, of the Ohio, their specialty was developing the Confederate flank and going around the Confederate flank. So before the Confederates could launch the attack, Cox had taken his division around the flank of the Confederates and had his artillery enfilading both Hood and Polk's lines. So Hood and Polk okay. went to uh, Johnson and said that they could not attack. So they pulled back again. And then at uh, uh, Johnson was hoping that uh, Sherman would attack at Alatoona. But Sherman had no intention of uh, attacking at Alatoona because he was familiar with the place and he knew that it had natural defensive uh, abilities. So they stretched out to, the, to Dallas. And once again, the 23rd Corps developed the Confederate flank and went around it. And it caused the uh, Confederates to pull back from the Dallas line that has Pickett's Mill in it. Now, Sherman hadn't learned a lesson yet that uh, you can't 
high-tech breastworks that are manned by quality troops. And he sent Hooker up to attack at Pickett's Mill, and it turned out to be a shooting gallery. That all stopped because the 23rd Corps, the Arm Second Army of the Ohio, went around the flank. Then eventually they made it back to Kennesaw Mountain and the 23rd Corps was on the far Union right and they were literally in front of Kolb's farm. For anybody that's ever been to the Kennesaw battlefield, uh, once again, Sherman ordered a frontal assault up the mountain, and it resulted in a bunch of guys getting killed. But in the meantime, Cox's division of the 23rd Corps uh, was laying plans to go around the Confederate right, or the Confederate left, I'm sorry, at Kolb's farm. But before that happened, Johnson stretched his army very thin on, on Kennesaw Mountain, and he formed Hood's Corps to strike the Union right flank. But Hood did not do enough reconnoitering, and he did not move far enough west. So when Hood launched his attack, instead of hitting the very end of the 23rd Corps, he hit where Hooker's 20th Corps and the 23rd Corps joined together. And once again, it was a slaughter. And a couple of days later, Schofield or Schofield advanced Cox and Cox made it across a couple creeks and actually was closer to Atlanta than Johnson was. Really? So Johnson had to abandon Kennesaw and he fell back to the Chattahoochee. Now an interesting thing happened at Chattahoochee. The Army of the Ohio had their own cavalry division, and they sent Stoneman's cavalry. Stoneman uh, commanded the uh, uh, Army of the Ohio's cavalry, and they sent him to the far Union right where he captured a bridge across the Chattahoochee. And in the meantime, very quietly, they moved the second and third division of the 23rd Corps up at a place called Soap Creek, which is also called Cavalry Ford and Rottenwood Creek and uh, a whole lot of different names. And it's universally misspelled by the soldiers. They all spell it S-O-A-P. But the creek itself is actually named S-O-P-E. And the creek ran in, in at an angle. And they were able to hide pontoons in the creek. And... Uh, the second division uh, asked for any boat handlers and they went down and uh, onto these pontoon boats and they loaded them up with uh, infantrymen and at a given signal they come shooting out of uh, Soap Creek and cross the Chattahoochee the Confederates had only had some cavalry there and one piece of artillery. 
the one piece of artillery got a single shot off. And then the second division had kept hidden and they moved up and they laid down a uh, suppressive fire on the Confederate positions. So Cox's division went across the river with almost no opposition. And then the 103rd Division, uh, 103rd Ohio in Cox's division, they had found a, a fish dam and they waded the river and they also made it across without, without any uh, real resistance. So probably the, the strongest position after uh, Kennesaw, uh, the Chattahoochee River was breached and uh, the Union was across. And then, uh, you know, people want to blame Johnson for not having uh, any uh, any plans to attack. But the first Battle of Atlanta at Peachtree Creek, that was a, a plan that Johnson had developed, and it was to try to catch the Army of the Cumberland while it was crossing Peachtree Creek and defy, uh, you know, uh, yeah. well, defeat told, it while it was halfway across. What I've been told is the Confederate attack didn't start for like eight hours or something like that. Is, is that correct? I mean, you know why it took the Confederates so long to launch that attack? Just, I mean, it's so hard to yeah, communicate. Uh, I, well, I have an observation. I have an observation why. I think Hood consistently underestimated how far his infantry could move in a given amount of time. I think he did it at Kolb's farm. I think he did it at Peachtree Creek. And so as a consequence, you had these divisions coming in in dribs and drabs. And instead of launching a massed attack, they launched disjointed attacks. I think the same thing happened at the Howard House attack where McPherson was killed. The he expected the his troops to march farther than they could. And as a consequence, when they got there, everybody was launching attacks at different times. There was actually one uh one division that was getting hit from both sides, but the Confederates never managed to hit them at the same time. So they would fight off one attack, crawl across their breastworks and fight off the next attack, crawl back across their breastworks and fight off the next attack. So they were hopping back and forth across their breastworks, which should tell you they were pretty damn good troops. And then his third attack, was uh, a complete disaster. He was supposed to hit the uh, Union flank, and once again, he did not go far enough. He did not do his recon, and instead of hitting uh, the flank, he hit uh, entrenchments. And the Yankees were as good as it, uh, at digging as the Confederates were, as a matter of fact, that uh, the first book I wrote, I found that they did they dug thirty seven lines of breastworks in the Atlanta campaign alone. Both sides, or they were at the front a hundred and twenty. I'm sorry. The both sides dug thirty seven lines, or just the um, the Yanks? Or... Well, just that. 
just that one regiment. Oh, just that they one dug regiment. Thirty-seven oh, lines oh, wow. of. Uh, yeah. Uh, out of the Wait, 120, uh, 21 days of the Atlanta campaign, they were at the front 120. They were at the front now, 120 days? Oh, wow. You're talking about... So they, were engaged, they were engaged yeah. continuously then. I mean, they were they were engaged from basically the entire campaign. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about this the other day. Um, uh, the Army of the Cumberland alone spent 200,000 rounds of rifle ammunition a day on the skirmish line with no major battles. They spent 1,200 artillery rounds a day. So I think if you add in uh, the Army of the Tennessee and the Army of the Ohio, they probably spent 375 rounds of ammunition a day and probably close to 2,000 artillery rounds a day. Without a day? Uh, and that's not counting the major battles. Yeah. So this is so a day. Must be getting and that's not counting the major battle. So they must be getting supplies like almost every day then, right? I mean. Well, they had to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, you just the had, Confederates I mean, you had to never managed to cut. Um, okay. Um, the Confederates so never managed to cut the, the supply line. Okay. Was, um. So uh, when you get through this, because I want to, uh, I want to talk to you about something else. I want to do another one with you too. Um, was uh, were they at Nashville after uh, Franklin? Yes. Yes. So tell me after um, you know after the debacle in Nashville, what happened to them then? I mean, what tell what you know? They go occupation duties. They go after wood. Well, I mean, what happened to them in the end of the war? They, both sides were pretty well used up. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize this, but half of Sherman's army at the start of the Atlanta campaign had malaria. One month in, half also had scurvy. And I would have, I would bet it was just as bad with the Confederates. So these guys were fighting sick on their feet. At one point, the whole regiment of the 118th was down to 120 men. After Atlanta fell, they pulled back and they let everybody rest up a little while. Uh, Hood pulled back to Lovejoy Station and eventually to um, Palmetto Station. And then Davis came out, and Davis wanted him to attack Sherman's uh, supply lines. So Hood first struck Big Shanty. And you may know that Big Shanty was the town that the great locomotive chase started in. No, that's why that. that's where the Yankees stole the engine. Yeah. Well, that's where the, that train is there. You can go see it there at Big Shanty. But uh that's where the they stole that train and ran north trying to burn bridges. But anyhow, they cut the they cut the tracks there, but by that time, uh, Sherman had stockpiled an awful lot of supplies in in Atlanta, and uh, Hood moved up, and he decided to attack Altoona. 
at the time, there was only one regiment of Federals there, and he sent, Hood sent a divis, division to attack them. But General Course rounded up two other regiments, and they went marching, and they got there just before the Confederates did. And they were able to, to hold the place. One of the great lines, two of the great lines of the Civil War came from there. Uh, Sherman signaled from the top of Kennesaw, hold the fort, I am coming. And that's where the phrase hold the fort came from. And the second thing, when he got there, uh, General Course had had a musket ball uh, skim his cheek and cut off part of his ear. And Sherman walked up to him and said, well, damn, Course, they came damn near to missing you. <laughs> Which I think is pretty damn good. <laughs> okay. And then, um, uh, Hood, tried, Hood tried to pull back into Atlanta, Alabama and he was expecting pontoons so he could cross the Tennessee River. They did not come. And uh, he eventually yeah. kept moving west. And finally, Sherman got tired of uh, the pursuit. About and an he hour said... Before about an hour from my house, this little town called Jacksonville, there's a house there that's still standing that has a marker out front that's um, where uh, General Hood spent um, the night when he was coming through Alabama. Um, just a little tidbit of information, because Hood was making some pretty good time in this march. I mean, wasn't he? Well, I think they all were. Uh, uh, you know, these guys, these guys were tough. I mean, uh, the guys that I wrote about, the 118th, they claimed that uh, they marched 380 miles chasing Hood after Atlanta. Uh, 104th Ohio said they did 412. And this is just in a couple of weeks. So they, what is the they were, they were... The the second one? Yeah. Sherman's other army. Sherman, okay, I like that. Uh, is it gonna be found on Amazon too? Okay. Um is um is there anything you know, um, I don't know that. I don't know where they're going. Do you have a or do you, you do you have a publisher or are you self publishing your No, it's a uh, uh, little Miami publishing in uh, in Ohio is publishing it. Okay. Um, she said, I mean, she told me that she didn't like uh, publishing with uh, Amazon because they damage your books and then send them back. But um, um, I mean, because this is really a book that needs she's to, saying uh, that uh, that that people need to hear know about. I mean. I mean, this this could be taught. I mean, this is probably used in colleges one one day. Well, I hope that it's at least used as uh, research for the East Tennessee campaign and the Atlanta campaign. Uh, but um, where I really like think it's strong. Do what? Where I really think it's strong is that I have made observations about Spring Hill and the Battle of Franklin that I haven't heard anybody else make. And part of it is because there's not been a history of the Army of the Ohio. And because of that, if you read a history of... Uh, the Army of the Cumberland that the 4th Division was in, or uh, the 4th Corps was in, you would never know the 23rd Corps took 
any part in the uh, Battle of Franklin at all. They just kind of claimed all the responsibility. Well, the, re the reality was because of one of their generals screw up, they damn near lost the battle. And an officer in the 23rd Corps said the 4th Corps would have been a hell of a lot more useful to us if they'd have been in Nashville. Um, so the observations that I, that I have made is that in the Atlanta campaign, nine different times the Army of the Ohio developed or went around the flank of the Confederates. Wow. They were flankers. They were a small army, so they were fast. And I actually found a letter from a guy in the 104th Ohio when the 23rd Corps hooked back up with uh, Sherman in North Carolina, and they had been issued new uniforms when they went through Washington because, uh, you know, they were wearing rags. And they get down there, and Sherman's guys see these guys in new uniforms, start giving them a hard time thinking they're all rookies. And they got bad mouthed right back. And so they said, uh, hey, who are you guys? And uh, somebody yelled back, 23rd Corps. And a guy in Sherman's ranks shouted, it's okay, boys. It's Sherman's flanking machine. <laughs> um, now, this is this is. This is important because of what happened at Spring Hill. Uh, the Union moved as far south as Pulaski, Tennessee. Oh, wow. That's just, uh, and their job. Yeah, that's just across the Alabama Tennessee line. Yeah. And uh, their job was to delay the Confederate advance. Because Thomas was in Nashville trying to organize a defense. And he was bringing in a corps from uh, out west somewhere. He was gathering all these little detachments. And he was also trying to uh, rehorse his cavalry. And he wanted to rearm. All of his cavalry was Spencer carbines. That's, yeah, so, that, okay. So what they did was they would hold as long as they could and try to fall back before they got trapped. Uh, at Columbia, it was a pretty close run thing. Uh, Cox's division. I think the place was called Hurricane, where they were at. Uh, they heard firing on, on the pike to the east of them. And so they started marching hard for uh, uh, Columbia. And they got there just as uh, the Union Cavalry was being pressed back by Forrest. And... They pitched into Forrest, and Forrest decided he didn't want to fight infantry there. So he pulled back, and he gave the Federals time to pull back to Columbia. And they all eventually moved back across the river, and they had a defensive line on the, on the north edge of the river. Now, the Columbia-Franklin Pike was quality road uh, they say it was macadamized I think that means it's, it, it had stone the hey, let me, let me could determine about. on flanking 
let me ask you something about because um, uh, some I've heard um, regarding Forrest. Uh, you know, some people have him as this mythical legend. You, you know, um, as a fighter. Um, you know, I'm I'm not one of those people who are you know that sings praises or you know to cry him as a demon. You know, I, I look at him as just like I would any other, or great as I would any other general. But all his, um, but I've heard on the, uh, when Hood was retreating with the remnants or whatever was left of his army, that Forrest put up a tenacious rear guard action um, that saved what soldiers he had left. Is that is that true? That is true. However, I think he did a piss poor job until they got to Nashville. And then, but his rear guard action to protect what was left of Hood's army was magnificent. Okay. So from there, um, um, what what else? Um, well, what else can I do? Because uh, I want to I want to do another. I want to talk to, it, well, to you about another subject too. Well, uh, Hood launched his attack, uh, a flanking attack, across the Duck River. And I have always wondered why he did not immediately turn left and go down and hit the Union Army in the flank. The reason for that is Hood left most of his artillery on the south bank of the Duck River. He had also forced a pontoon bridge across the river, and the Union had controlled it as a bridgehead. But he left two divisions on the south bank of the duck. If Hood had turned left immediately, he'd have hit the Union in the flank. Any defensive line that the Union set up would have had to bend north and south, and the Confederate artillery across the river would have enfiladed it. He could have pushed those two divisions across the uh, across the pontoon bridge and caught them in a pincher movement. That might have been pretty bloody, but I think he could have done it. But he didn't do that. He could have again attacked at a place called Rutherford Creek, but he marched past that, and he came up to Spring Hill. Now, the Confederate Army mar marched on a much, much worse road than the Columbia Franklin Pike was on. Schofield suspected that Hood was up to something, but his cavalry had been pushed away by by Forrest, and so he didn't really know what they were doing. But he sent General Stanley with two divisions of his corps. Stanley dropped one division off at uh, Rutherford Creek, and the other division he took to Spring Hill. The very first Confederate corps that got to Spring Hill was Cheatham's. And Cheatham felt like he just had to move up and cut the pike. And all of a sudden, he started drawing very heavy fire from his right flank around the town of Spring Hill. Now, Cheatham had no idea these guys were there. So it was a complete surprise to Cheatham. And all of a sudden, he thinks he's in for a, a leisurely stroll to the pike, and he's in a, in a horrendous fight. And uh, Lee came up behind Cheatham and extended to... Cheatham's right, and he got in a fight with uh, this division of Federals at Spring Hill. 
And then Forrest came up to Cheatham's right, and he got in a fight with these Federals. This one Union division stood off three-quarter of Confederates, and they did a pretty damn good job. However, the division was commanded by Wagner, and Wagner screwed up big time the next day at Franklin, and because of that, all of his prior actions are overshadowed by his failure at uh, Franklin. Now, people talk about Spring Hill, and I've read people say, well, if they'd have just got a division across the road, the Yankees would have been trapped and had to surrender. Well, I got a different view. If um, you, uh, these are, these are my, veterans. Where, where, where was Both sides. Uh, well, probably from further west, Alabama, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll but, guess uh, there something. Well, uh, yeah, it had to be something out of Alabama. Well, they um, had uh, – the Confederates had bait and supply in, in position to cut the Columbia Franklin Pike. And Cheatham still didn't know what was going on, and he ordered Cheatham to move up and hook up with him. Well, I think this is very strange. Bait was literally within 75 yards of the Columbia Franklin Pike. And Ruger's 23rd Corps Division was marching up the, the Columbia Franklin Pike, and they were in battle formation already. Strickland's brigade started brushing into bait. They stopped to, uh, to do some skirmishing with bait, and the infantrymen had trouble convincing their officers that they were fighting Confederates because they saw this great line of uh, bonfires uh, to the east of the Columbia Franklin Pike, and everybody assumed it was Wagner. Well, it wasn't. It was the Confederate Army. And uh, the brigade that the 118th was in, uh, Orlando Moores, they marched around Strickland, and a Confederate in Granbury's brigade said, uh, this was an officer, said the Yankees were so close, we could hear the grass rustling against their legs as they were marching. God. Well, that's pretty damn close. I mean, that you're talking about inches. Now, this is my thought. This is my thought. If Bait would have got his division across the road, number one, when Stanley went to uh, Spring Hill, he took the whole Fourth Corps artillery reserve with him. And Bait's back would have been to that artillery reserve their western flank would have been in the air. There was nothing over there for them to anchor on. So you had these guys marching up the pike who were Sherman's flanking machine. Now, they looked to the right and they saw Confederate bonfires 
they looked to the left and they saw darkness, where do you think they'd go? They'd go right around the end of bait and either roll him up or just go around him. The same thing would have happened to the north of uh, Spring Hill with Stewart. Forrest did try to cut the road, but a brigade of uh, Union infantry brushed Forrest off. And uh, that whole night, the Union Army stayed awake and marched. And I think I think Spring Hill is a failure of the entire Confederate officer chain. Nobody showed any initiative. Nobody went out to the pike to see what the hell was going on. Everybody went to sleep. Well, the Yankees didn't go to sleep. And we talked a little about this before. After the war, Hood died fairly young from, uh, I think, a typhus epidemic. But um, it came out from other generals that had a lot to be ashamed of from Spring Hill that Hood was using laudanum at Spring Hill, and he went to sleep. Well, here, three or four years ago, an author found a trunk full of General Hood's papers belonging to a descendant of his. And in the paperwork, was a was the day book of Hood's surgery, the surgeon. And Hood only took laudanum one time, and it was the day after they cut his leg off. And he didn't like the way it made him feel, and he never took it again. So that whole bullshit about Hood being... Uh, on laudanum, and that's why they missed out at Spring Hill. It just doesn't carry anymore. It was a lie when they wrote it, but most of them assumed that Hood would never be able to counteract it. They were trying to protect their own reputations. And then a lot of historians believed it. The very first thing I ever wrote was for um, the magazine America Civil War, and I wrote it on the Battle of Franklin. And I got to tell you, I believe the uh, the famous historians, and I wrote it too. And in the book on the 23rd Corps, I make a, a special paragraph to apologize for that. So it was just a lack of everything that you would expect an officer corps to do, from lieutenant to general. And conversely, the Yankees, from private to general, knew they had to get by Spring Hill. And... uh I think by that time of the war, the veterans of both sides were very nearly panic-proof. Mike, let me so ask you they this. They would not have... Why, um, why did Hood keep watching these attacks? Because he was ordered to. Davis ordered him to. Hood was only following okay. uh, orders. 
I mean, so uh, you know, I've made and this argument right here. It was Davis, and I was. So, let, let me ask you this: so I, I've made this argument about Hood. Hood gets bashed by so many people. You know, he's worst general ever. Um, blah blah blah, horrible. You know, I look at it as a different, like what you just said. He was ordered to do. I don't think um, Hood was a horrible general. I think he was put in an impossible situation that I don't care if you had Robert E. Lee commanding those troops. They would not have been successful in what he was attempting to do. Well, who tried to be Robert E. Lee? Who taught who taught Hood how to be a general? It was Robert E. Lee. And when Hood was with Lee, Lee still had enough troops that they could attack and die. You know, Hood's attack at uh, at Franklin is no less nonsensical than Lee's attack at Malvern Hill or Lee's attack at uh, in Pickett's Charge. But for some reason... Everybody lets Lee skate on those, but nobody lets Hood skate. But one of the things that I've found about Franklin is when Hood came up to Franklin, once again, he was out of daylight. And he started deploying his troops. But it was dark enough that they really couldn't see. And he put three divisions between the railroad and the Lewisburg Pike. And that's where they attacked. And they were supposed to, they were supposed to guide on the railroad and on the Lewisburg Pike. The problem with that is it was shaped like a funnel. And you couldn't see that from where Hood made the deployments. So what happened was all these brigades started stacking up. And then it was just a killing zone for the federal artillery. In the middle, where the Columbia Frank uh, the Columbia Franklin Pike went through. The last thing in the world that Schofield wanted to do was fight at Franklin. He had gotten there expecting there to be pontoon boats so he could get a get across the river and get away. The pontoons weren't there. So Schofield went and got his engineers and they uh, laid planks across the railroad bridge. They uh, they improved the Ford, and by about three thirty, the all of the Union supply wagons were across the Harpeth River. Now, they estimate that Schofield had between eight hundred and a thousand wagons, plus the twenty third arc artillery was all across. Now, if you think about, well, let me explain. The, the, the Harpeth makes a big, almost oxbow bend with the river to the north and to the south. The Union trenches go from river to uh, riverbank to riverbank. So... Schofield intended to pull his army back across the Harpeth. When Hood started to de deploy, they all realized it was too late. Nobody wants to fight with a river at their back. Schofield didn't want to fight with a river at his back. But if Hood would have had more light to see, 
his closest road to get to Schofield's Bridges and Ford was right straight down the Columbia Franklin Pike, right in front of the Carter House. Now, in that critical area, he only deployed two divisions. There's three on the right that were getting stacked up, but only two where he was. Or, or in the middle where uh, Claiborne was and Brown. I have always thought that if he'd have put two of those divisions in the center for his powerful punch and had Wagner screwed up, Wagner's screw up was he left two brigades out front, a half mile out front, and he refused to bring them back in. So his men held too long. And because they held too long, the Confederates were right on their breastworks when they broke and they headed for the main line. So the main line could not fire. Now, one of the other things that happened at Franklin was that the Confederates lost 14 generals, 13 killed or wounded, and one captured. They lost 50-some regimental commanders. They lost 83 flag bearers. And I think the reason was nobody could shoot. Normally, in these battles, they started firing at 250 to 300 yards. I found an account from the surgeon of the 118th Ohio, and he says that after the second Union volley, you could barely see the face of the man standing next to you. They so were if they were firing at 300 yards, yeah, if they were firing at 300 yards, you know, they'd have been firing blind. But they couldn't fire until the Yankees got in. And I think the majority of the Confederates in the center was, were within about 25 yards when they opened up. And they killed Claiborne and Granbury there right off the bat. Uh, Adams got killed a little to the right of there, trying to jump his horse over a breastworks. But he made a horrible decision there. He tried to jump his horse over a regiment that had two entire companies armed with 14-shot Henry rifles. The regiment right next to them had 100 Spencers. And that's where he tried to jump his horse. And they just riddled him and the horse. So, um... Now, my, um, the other thing they, is, uh, they I broke know, through the center. Yeah. What? I didn't hear you. Oh, oh I was saying, um, um, nothing. I said, I, I want to talk to you about, um, when you get through that, I want to talk to you about, uh, another subject, um, while I got you on the phone. Okay. Well, let me, let me finish up here a little bit. Yeah, yeah. One of yeah, the things yeah. that happened was there was a very big traverse that ran from the Carter Cotton Gen back to the main line. It was almost a two regiment front there. So the Confederates that broke through the center were automatically in a two way crossfire. In addition to that, the Yankees had another line 
that they had put two completely green regiments in, the 44th Missouri, the 183rd Ohio. Now, both of these regiments were near 1,000 men each. That's almost what a brigade in the 23rd Corps had. They were, you know, they were just used up. So when this breakthrough happened, they fell back on these, on the 44th and the 183rd, and these guys started opening fire uh, to the Confederate front. Ope Dyke's brigade, he had refused to put his men out front with uh, uh, the other two brigades of Wagner. And they came charging forward up to the line of the 44th and uh, 183rd. In addition to that, east of the road was another 1,000-man unit, the 175th Ohio. They came charging forward on the heels of the 8th Tennessee, who were armed with six-shot Colt revolving rifles, and the 14th and the 16th Kentucky. They came, they all came charging forward and they restored the Union line that was to the east of uh, the Columbia Franklin Pike. That put all the Confederates in their front in a horrible position because they couldn't fall back because to do so, meant that they were falling back across the killing zone. It was so bad that Confederates standing in the uh, in front of the the breastworks of the that they had captured had reached the point that if they were hit they couldn't fall over because the dead was stacked so deep around them that God, they couldn't God. fall. Now, that all being said, my observation is almost all the maps that you see of the Battle of Franklin, they draw a straight line from the Carter Creek Pike over to the Columbia Franklin Pike at the Carter House. There's no way in hell that veterans of trench warfare would have dug a straight trench. Right. No way. Because if you break into a straight trench, then you're shooting down a bowling alley. Right. Well, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Cartwright, who used to be head of the Carter House, and he's now head of the, the Lots House on the battlefield, he drew... I think the most detailed map of the battlefield. And it is so detailed that he has the regiments, all, all of the Yankee regiments are identified. Well, in Moore's brigade of the second division that goes from the Locust Grove to the Carter Creek Pike, that line makes a big inverse curve. On the west of that inverse curve, there's a traverse that juts out south. That's where the 118th Ohio was. So these guys in the inverse curve, they could fire into the backs of any Confederates that were up against the breastworks to their sides. Now, in my book, I draw out a, a the average Springfield or infield was 
accurate to 400 yards. I read a study that said an average marksman could put seven out of 10 rounds in a four foot target at 400 yards, which means if you aim at the belt plate of one man, you're either gonna hit him or the man on either side seven out of 10 times. Wow. Now, like I say, they only had two aimed shots, but through that 400 yard field of fire in front of the 118th, eight Confederate brigades marched. Now, I say they're accurate to 400 yards. They'll kill you at 900 yards. Correct. So everything that went through or over the Confederates landed in Brown's division. So Brown was actually in a three-way crossfire. To make matters worse, when the last Confederate brigades, the last attacks happened on, on in front of Moore. Uh, they estimate that Moore took 14 separate attacks, but the Confederates put guys with torches on either end of the line so that the, they could align themselves. Well, all the Yankees did was aim between the torches. And so to give you an idea of what the casualties were, the Confederates lost more, more men killed at Franklin than they did at Shiloh. They lost wow. more men killed than Burnside did at Fredericksburg. They lost all as almost as many men killed as Grant did at Petersburg in their attacks. To put it in a modern perspective, there were about 35,000 guys on the field. There were 22 Confederate brigades. There were eight brigades of Union infantry. Two of those brigades were knocked out early, and most of them did not fight again. Some of them stopped at the second, uh, the second line and fought. But 10,000 men out of those 35,000 went down in four hours. The Carter House estimates that 8,000 of them went down in a 500 square yard area. Now to put that in perspective in modern terms, on D-Day, we landed 155,000 troops. In 24 hours, fighting pre-sighted German artillery and German machine guns, we took 10,000 casualties. The same as we inflicted on each other in, in four hours at Franklin, it took 24 hours at Normandy. At Peleliu, we had almost uh, which was our highest casualty by percentage in the Pacific, we had almost the same number killed as was killed at Franklin. But that was a battle that took place over four months. Franklin is horrendous. So, uh, final now, question for... Question? A final question. I'll start off with you on something else. Um, it, what is it about Franklin? Is it because you had these regiments and you had family that was in it? Is that what fascinates with, you with it so much, or is it just the slaughter? No, uh, Franklin is an easy battle to study. You know, okay. if you if you want to well, study Gettysburg. You gotta study three days. 
but are so I know it's a couple of them are just so fat, fascinated with it like you are. And I just you know what what's what's your draw though to what what you know what makes you so um drawn to to uh, that particular fight. I read an Englishman uh, who was a historian, and he said that Franklin was the greatest charge in American military history. I believe he is right. More Confederates charged at Franklin than charged with Pickett at Gettysburg, and they went twice as far. Okay. However, if Franklin is the greatest charge in American military history, it follows then that the eight brigades that stopped those 22 brigades cold had to have put up one of the greatest defenses in American military history. Fire assessment. I read a thing one time. I read a thing one time that General Cheatham was on a train somewhere. And uh, there was a man sitting on the train and said, excuse me, are you General Cheatham? And he said, well, yes, sir, I am. And uh, the guy said, I was on a lot of battlefield with you, General. And uh, Cheatham said, oh, what regiment? And he said, well, I wore the blue, General. And Cheatham said, well, what battles were you on? In. And the guy said, Franklin. And Cheatham said, any man that was at Franklin's, a brother of mine, handed the guy a cigar and ordered him a whiskey because it was such a horrendous fight that most of that was the thing that most of them remembered I think the rest of their lives okay all right so we're, so we're gonna pause for a second I'm gonna introduce you again all right Chris Peaks here back with Civil War story and Mike Klinger and author who's just finished up a second book um Mike I'm gonna ask you a question that um, you know, I haven't really talked to too many people about, and uh, I think you'd be a perfect one. Um, you know, I like you, Mike. Uh, you're one of my favorite people to uh, comment with stuff on. Um, you know, I never see you throw uh, hatred towards Southerners um, or, or you know hold anything um, against them. Um, you know, in you. Sh same thing with me. You, you never see me make comments like that. But we see people on both sides uh, in these Facebook groups that just vilify the other. Um, you know, they, they never bring any type of commentary um, that's, you know, insightful or uh, bring about conversation or, or discussion. It's just downright hatred. Why, after... 160 years are Americans, North and South, still with this much animosity towards each other. Well, I guess I don't really know. Um, they, uh, I think part of it is that that people people believe what they're they're comfortable with believing. So if they have to take a stand against something that they dearly hold. Uh, important they're willing to believe whatever they whoever they're willing to believe whoever tells them what they want to hear and an awful lot of those guys will shut right up if you say what's your source on that where can I read that? 
and they know that there's no backing for most of it. There's just not. So I don't think it's a lot different than our politics today. There's all this hatred and everybody is accusing everybody of everything else. And if you ask, ask people, I mean, I've heard, I've heard people say some of the most outlandish things and I'll say, Does that strike you as a reasonable assumption? Did you sit down and rationalize that all out? Or did you just go with whoever you wanted to agree with? And I think it's the same thing today. I think, you know, people just do not... Pay attention to the facts. Now, I tried to the best of my ability to write accurately in both of these books. But sometimes I had to quote soldiers and I... You know, I don't believe some of their quotes would have stood up. But, for instance, in the 118th book, their color sergeant early on said that he felt that the war was over slavery. Okay. But he had, he had a take on it that I have never heard anybody else say. He said, we have to stop the, you still there? Yeah, I'm listening to you. He said, we had to stop the slavery of the black man because if we did not, it would not be long until they enslaved the poor white man, too. And I have never heard anybody say that. Really? But if you think about, if you think about what happened in the coal fields in uh, West Virginia with their uh, company stores and the valleys guarded so that the... Uh, the miners and their families couldn't leave. He may have been right, Chris. That I've, you know, I've never thought of that because you know somebody had made a point to me when t we was discussing, um, the you know the our southern aristocracies. I mean, there's no doubt why the southern aristocracies has wanted to secede. You know, um, it, it was over slavery and. People have said that I'm a, an apologist for Southern, you know, for Southerners for uh, owning slaves, and no, I'm not an apologist. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm never, I'm not going to apologize for that. I mean, because here, here's, here's why. I mean, uh, for one, you know, I'm, obviously slavery was wrong, but at that time, slavery was legal in the United States. Okay, and that was worth four trillion dollars to the Southern economy. So you're damn right. They were not letting that go without a fight. You know as well as I do, um, there was no way you you know you was going to take. I mean, imagine taking four trillion dollars that wealth out of today's economy. There's no way this they was going to let that go. So I mean, I understand why they went. Um, it, but for the average Southern soldier, uh, they weren't much different than the blacks that were enslaved. They probably had more. I mean, in common wise, than what they did. Uh, and, you know, here they are fighting for this, you know, institution of slavery, which, um, you know, some people are going to say, no, the war went fall was black, whatever. Um, you yeah, know, but here they are fighting for this, and they weren't really much different than what they were. And you may be right. They may have. I think that. Were... I, I actually think that. 
the poor Southerner that fought for the aristocracy of the South was one of the great con jobs in history. And, you know, and that was probably By the some... same token. By the same token, you can talk about why did the Union fight? Well, I think oh. that there was a small but very vocal minority of abolitionists. By far, the largest percentage were Federalists or people who wanted to preserve the Union. But I think there's an interesting third group. I think a hell of a lot of the immigrants fought for an entirely different reason. And if you think about it, in Europe, there were massive revolutions all over continental Europe uh, between 1846 and 1848. What this was, was a revolt against royalty. Royalty. And a revolt against being a peasant. Now, one of the one of the guys in the 118th, the captain of my ancestor's company, he was a 1848er in Germany. He had been a doctor, and the 1848 revolution started, and he uh, fought for the revolution, lost, got thrown in prison for a couple years. They let him out, and he moved to America. And when the Civil War started, he said... It's the same fight against the aristocracy that I fought before. So I think you had an awful lot of European immigrants that were influenced by the 1846 to 1848 revolutions and when they came to America, they said, this is the only place on earth where they can't do that to us. Let me ask and you. we're not going to let them do that to us. Well, let me ask you this. I've asked this to different people before. And some have some have agreed with me. Some haven't. Um, uh, uh, but... Uh, I have, I have an interesting – first, let me say this. Um, I think that um, the, the South's worst mistake was is they over they underestimated that um, firing on Fort Sumter, that uh, I think that a lot of Northerners probably would have went you know, been fired up. But when they fired on Fort Sumter, they probably pissed those Northern boys off. Uh, um, I yeah. think that – I agree. I, I, mean, I think, I think that was a – a huge tactical error. I think that pissed them off when they fired on Fort Sumter. That pissed those northern boys off, and they, you know, they okay. By God, you want to fight? We're going to fight. Um, uh, I think that was, there's, that, you know, that, that, that was one. But here's the other one. At the beginning of the Civil War, the South was fighting for slavery. Um, that's that's, that's I mean that's in, in my opinion. Some people can say that. It, Whatever, and, and but that, I'm just that's just my my view. The, the southern the southern aristocracy seceded, started the war over slavery, um, and Lincoln wanted to keep the Union together. But by the end of the war, right, the North was fighting for slavery, and the South was fighting to preserve their nation. The, the South, the North was fighting to destroy slavery. Yes, yes, yes. Right. And exactly. the South was yeah. fighting South, to preserve. Yeah. 
the South, the North yeah. reasoning then was was, sli- was over, you know over the issue of slavery, destroying it. The South's issue then was trying by by eighteen sixty five, it was now trying to preserve itself as a nation. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I'm not saying people were not still that. Uh... I think, though, that probably the best thing that ever happened for the Union was Jefferson Davis. Um, I think Jefferson Davis made some absolutely foolish decisions. Now, let me ask you this. I myself am not a believer in black Confederates. Um, I'm not saying that it's impossible that there were some men that were of mixed color that were that could pass off as white or um, or what have you that fought for the South. I, I don't think that's outside. Um, you know, I think that's possible. There could have been a few of those, but I'm not a fit favor. I'm not a believer in there being, you know, regiments of black Confederate soldiers. I, I just don't believe that. I'm sure you don't either. Um, I think Jefferson Davis and the Confederate government was right by not trying to arm the slaves because could you see walking on a plantation and trying and arming these slaves and saying, here, I'm going to treat you, you know, I'm going to teach you how to shoot. I mean, that, that would have been a, a, a total slave rebellion. And then say, and then afterwards say, well, you're still a slave after the war. Well, yeah. Do you think that would have worked? You know, that all? just doesn't. That wouldn't have worked. I don't see that no. working. I mean, I don't see that working at but, all. I said, okay. Hey, you being yeah. from Alabama, I've got an interesting little factoid for you. Okay. Uh, I had three ancestors in the '46 Ohio. And the 46th Ohio was an unusual regiment. When they re-upped, they re-upped on the on the guarantee that they'd get Spencer rifles, not the carbines, the rifles. So from about uh, February of 1864, this regiment had Spencer rifles. Now, I think that happened for a couple of reasons. Their first commanding officer had written uh, the tactics for the use of the uh, Spencer rifle. And secondly, they were a good regiment and everybody wanted them to re-enlist. But my boy is researching them. Jacob or and he ran across something very in ja- huh? Jacob or Jacob or Jake, you, you, yeah. Jake. No, Jacob. But he ran across something very interesting. And I had found something that I thought was real interesting. I found a reunion. Uh, photo of the 46th Ohio taken in Van Wert and there are all these black guys scattered through it and obviously black men and I started doing a little uh, research and I found all these black cemeteries in Van Wert County, Ohio that had Military Stones said 46 Ohio. Now, Jake told me when the 46th Ohio was in northern Alabama, there were a lot of Quakers in that regiment. And they couldn't see anything, anything wrong with enlisting black guys. So they enlisted about two companies worth of black Alabamans. They also incre- uh, enlisted white Alabamans to make up another company. But 
Have you ever heard anything about this? No, I've never they heard They only ever that, talk no. about the entirely the entirely segregated uh regiments is all you ever hear about. But I'm telling you, I've seen pictures and they're at the reunion together. And like I say, they're buried in black cemeteries in Van Wert County. Now, these were black and white soldiers in the same unit? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think so. That's, and I don't I think mean, they that, were that, cooks. No, because the only thing I've ever heard... If you go look at the... If you go look at the uh, tombstones, it'll say Company E, 46 Ohio, Company F, 46 Ohio, uh, you know, Company A, 46 Ohio. They're scattered all through it, and they're listed as soldiers, not as cooks. No, um, I've, I've I've never heard that. The only thing that I that I remember about as far as Alabamians, uh, black soldiers is that one of the first units was a unit from Alabama that was used at Vicksburg. Yeah. Now you know one thing that people. By the way, that, I got a friend. I got a friend that. I got a friend that had ancestors in the. First Alabama Union Cavalry, too. Have you heard about you, them? You have ancestors in the First Alabama Cavalry or First Union Cavalry. I don't. A friend of mine does. A friend of mine does. And you know, those guys were Sherman's bodyguard. And they were raised in the three northeast counties of Alabama. The three northeast. Uh... They were just like they they were just like East Tennessee. They wanted to stay pro Union. Yeah, where I'm from, the the. Um... I'm from the North Central, and you know, I'm there were units that was raised in my area for the Southern. I've really not looked at Union, but yeah, from as you went North Central up, um, Central Alabama up, they were yeah, you're right, they, they were pro, um, they were pro Union. They didn't want anything to do with that war because they didn't the the Black Belt of Alabama. There's like 11 counties in Central to South Alabama where all of your um, plantations were at where most of your slave owners were at uh you know these guys the the articles of secession in alabama was a 61 to 49 or 61 to 39 vote you know it was not a blowout like or in any of the states really yeah i mean um but I, you know uh so, have you ever wondered yeah. why it didn't go to popular vote I always no, think that's I've why it never went to popular vote. I've never thought about I that. I think but it's you're because they have won. You're probably right. If it would have been a popular vote on secession or leaving, it probably would have lost. Because you think about even some of the yeah. um, Confederate leaders like Lee. Lee didn't support secession. I mean, you're. I've never thought yeah, about I, it. I, I it think went, it would have been voted down. Well, let me ask you this: somebody else, because somebody brought this up maybe one time, and they obviously they know a lot more about the constant the people who sat on the Supreme Court in 1860 than I do. They said, in their opinion, had it had 
the um, so South took their issue to court instead of fighting militarily, we could be having a whole different conversation today. Yeah, that's true. I think that's probably true. But well, I also point. think that I think that what happened was the South controlled uh, the House of Representatives and they controlled it for a long time because the House of Representatives is uh, the number of representatives is set by the popular number of people you have. And that's why they passed that law that said a black man was worth three fifths of a white man. And when Lincoln won and they had blocked uh, further expansion westward of slave states, I think that the South feared losing control of the House of Representatives. And basically, that's why they seceded. So instead of them saying, well, this is democracy, and we lost this round, we'll try again the next time, they took their ball and went home. Yeah, somebody else had brought that up to me too about saying that, you know, uh, you know they should have been okay. We lost this, and then seceded four years later, and that would have made it, you know, legal. Or, you know, or they would have had a better argument on it. Um, you know, obviously they want to wait four years later. I mean, uh, um, but like I said, you can't. You know, obviously the South tried to leave just over. Losing an election, you can't do that. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna do one more. Wouldn't surprise me to see it happen again. Yeah, you know, I mean, the way this country's going, I, I, I wouldn't be, I couldn't, I couldn't say it's impossible that it would never happen. Um, you know, because uh, for one thing. You know, our founders, uh, they never foreseen us being um, this big of a nation, this uh, diverse, this um, this this much um, you know um, stuff going on right now. Uh, so let's, let's do one more here, Mike. I'm going to talk to you about something. So, all right. Chris Tink's here back with author and historian Mike Klinger for another discussion. I want to talk to you about the, a little bit about the Atlanta campaign. Um, uh, you touched on this in one of our other discussions, uh, General Johnston. Um, people uh, credit him for, or, or uh, uh, attack, attack, well, attack, uh, criticize him for not attacking. Um, he was using a Fabian type strategy, trading territory for time. Now, for one, um, people try to say, and, and I, I've heard this since I was a kid. I guess if you hear it long enough, people begin to believe it. But uh, you know, Lincoln thought he was going to lose the election, and you know, obviously, we don't know what the polls were in 1860. There was no Gallup. I don't think he was ever in the trouble he thought he was because Americans have always had a history of you know rallying around the flag type thing. You know, when a president's up under duress, they, you know, usually uh, come to, come to their side. Um, so, but anyway, they say holding Atlanta, they say one link in the election and uh, it ultimately, you know, kept the, uh, prevented the South from winning. You know, th people don't realize the first the election of 1864 uh, did not matter who won that. Um, by that time, the war was over. Even if Lincoln had lost, 
uh, McClellan, who, first of all, never said he was going to uh, sue for peace. He said he was just going to pursue different war aims. By the time he took office, it would have been March of 18, March 5th, 1865. Um, there was no way the North was walking away, controlling eight out of 11 capitals, all the ports, 90 percent of the territory. And that would be like us walking away from Nazi Germany in, you know, late March 1865. Um you know, it, it just wasn't going to happen. I think McClellan would have been on the, the first uh, train to Petersburg in full military uniform to assume field command. Um, do, do you agree with that? Well, I'm, I'm flipping through uh, this book I had, the first on the 108th Ohio. Because I found out some interesting stuff on that. The uh, most of the home counties of the 118th, not all, but most, voted for McClellan. The only way that McC uh, Lincoln won Ohio was with the soldier vote, but uh, it was still pretty close. In the 118th Ohio, 94 men voted for Lincoln, 74 voted for McClellan. No, but so, what, 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 I mean, what I mean, though, is if even McClellan, if, if Whoever won that race, that was not going to end. The, the North was still going to win that war. Yeah, I don't think that they could have. I don't. I, I don't think that the armies would have tolerated it. Yeah, so I think the um, army of Potomac would have marched on Washington. Right. So, but, it, but so the question, I guess, I'm, I'm going the wrong way around. Look at it. You know, McClellan was. Um, I mean. If, if Johnson's hope was for a, you know political victory, you know that was a pie in the sky hope. Um, you know, with his hold in Atlanta, but his Fabian strategy is uh, is is there anything? I mean, should he, should he get criticized the way he gets criticized for it? Or I mean, did he have? Is that the only thing he really could do? Is trade? I don't think he should. I mean, it's the only thing. Is I mean, I don't think he, he should decide trade territory for time. He attacked at Resaca. He tried to attack at Cassville. He attacked at Kennesaw Mountain at Kolb's Farm. He, uh, well, Hood's first attack was at Johnson's plan. Johnson had to have everything perfect to have any hope of attack. The way Sherman arranged his three armies was he always had Thomas with the Army of the Cumberland in the center. It had 60,000 men in. Then he had the Army of the Ohio on a flank with about 20,000, or with about 10,000. And he had the Army of the Tennessee with 20,000. So Sherman knew that Thomas could probably hold any attack in the center. He literally wrote that he believed that if Johnson attacked either the Army of Tennessee, the Army of the Tennessee, or the Army of the Ohio, they would fight long enough that he could march people from the Army of the Cumberland to their assistance. So I think Johnson kind of gets a raw deal on that. Uh, and the other thing that people don't mention is Johnson begged Davis 
to send cavalry from Mississippi and Alabama to strike Sherman's supply line. And they absolutely refused. Wheeler tried once and went off on a tangent somehow, ended clear up by Knoxville, and uh, didn't accomplish nothing. But Johnson never had enough men because the Union Army could stretch out much farther than he could. He never had enough men to create a mobile reserve of infantrymen to go to try to attack uh, Sherman's supply lines. And the cavalry just did not tear up tracks long enough. It had to be infantry. And they they just didn't have the manpower. Well, um, as far as um, General um, Hood goes, for him, for him to get that job, was he even um, the uh, highest-ranking officer? I don't know. I don't think he was, but he was. Uh... Jefferson Davis's darling and Hood was Hood was writing letters to uh Jefferson Davis complaining about Johnson Johnson didn't find out about it till uh almost just before the end of the war and at that point he demanded a court martial of Hood but the war ended before anything could be done Okay, Mike, I think that's all I've got for you. Um, I think Jefferson Davis. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you for talking to me. Well, I enjoyed it, man. Um, I'll go ahead and cut this recording off here um, and talk to you for a second offline or talk to you for a second off this right here. Um yeah, I I enjoyed it. Uh, well, where's that here? Uh, hold up a second. Here we go. Zoom meeting in progress. Stop the recording.